chapter 3. John chapter 3. This morning we're going to begin reading verse 13 in just uh, a few moments. We're truly blessed with so many great musicians here uh, in our church. As you're turning there, you know, I was an avid baseball card collector as a child. In fact, between the years 1974 and 1979, I collected about 3,700 baseball cards pack by pack. And during that time, I was able to obtain some cards that were very valuable uh, in what you typically would like to get is a card before someone becomes famous. And I had a handful of those. But the most unusual, valuable card that I had, and by valuable, I'm speaking relatively to a normal card, uh, was a very interesting card. It was a card uh, about a player named Nate Colbert, uh, and it was in 1974. In the card, they were numbered 1 to 600. His was number 125. And what's interesting about it is Nate Colbert, who passed away earlier this year, was not a famous player. He had a pedestrian baseball career. He hit some home runs. He had uh, about three or four good years. However, his batting average for career was below uh, 250. He didn't hit a great number of home runs. So you said, okay, what makes that card valuable? It's that it was a mistake. You see, for years there had been no baseball team in Washington, D.C. when the Senators uh, were moved and uh, there was no baseball team in Washington, D.C. But in 1974, there was an anticipation that the team in San Diego, the Padres, would move all the way from the West Coast to the East Coast to Washington, D.C., and they would then become the Washington team. Well, they didn't have even a nickname for the team, so my card that would usually have the name of the city and then the name of the mascot had Washington, and then it had, I was wondering, what's a Natalie? But it was National Abbreviated League. And so as a result of that, the team never made, and so there were about 15 players who had this card that was a mistake, and the mistake is what made the card valuable. You know, in the world of collecting, everyone is looking for that which is special, uh, a special stamp, a treasured coin, a piece of jewelry that is unique, a, a discontinued piece of glassware, and, and the, the very uniqueness of that thing is what makes it valuable. But what really makes something valuable is if it is an exclusive item, a one-of-a-kind one of item, something that's not paralleled. In stamp collecting, the most valuable stamp in the world is actually was produced as a one cent stamp. The British Guyana one cent black stamp on magenta color produced in 1856 is, is valued at 9 million British pounds. That's 11.2 million US dollars. Don't you wish you had invested in a penny uh, a number of years ago that would turn out to be $11.2 million. But what makes that stamp valuable is its exclusivity. There is only one known stamp of this nature in existence today. Isn't it interesting that in our society, whereas in the area of collecting, exclusivity is valued. In our society today, it is frowned upon. Popular culture is trying to remove any exclusivity, any absolute. For instance, you can be a universalist and say, everybody's all right with God and everybody's the same, and you'll find a seat at the table in our culture uh, today. Y you can be a pluralist, saying that every religion leads to the same end and everybody will applaud you. But if you begin to speak the truth that Jesus and Jesus alone is Lord, and the only way to salvation, well, you know where society would take you today. But the fact of the matter is that's the truth. 
God's word attests to that truth. The resurrection of Jesus Christ stands as a testament to that truth. And so today we're going to look at how the Bible and Jesus himself attest to the exclusive nature of in the claims of Jesus Christ. Look with me at John chapter 3. I want to begin in verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world that he might condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because that one is not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. Let us pray. Father, as we look to your word today, we attest, Lord, to the authority of your word. Every word that is written here is truth. The prophecies either have been fulfilled, are being fulfilled, will be fulfilled. And so, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, in the midst of this world of chaos, Lord, he brings order. He brings truth. He brings the way to eternal life. So speak to our hearts, Lord, we pray in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. We're continuing our look, as we did last week, at Jesus' dialogue with Nicodemus, one of the most famous dialogues in all the Bible. In fact, almost or maybe a little more than half of John chapter 3 deals exclusively with this discussion that Jesus had with Nicodemus. Last week, we saw the absolute claim of Jesus, where Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, Nicodemus didn't understand all that was, but Jesus, using the example of the wind and the direction and the origin of the wind, said, even though you don't understand it, you still experience it, and it's real. And so as we look at that absolute claim today, um, we're going to look today that while there are many answers in the world to various problems, there's only one answer to the most extreme problem that we have, sin, and the resultant death. And that answer is Jesus and Jesus alone. He is the rose in the midst of the thorns. He's the stream of light in the midst of darkness. He's the calm in the midst of a storm. And he is the Father's sole provision for the greatest need of our souls. And that is that we be in right standing with God. You come here today, there may be various needs you have. I don't know those. I, I wouldn't begin to, to enter your mind to understand those things. But I do know this. If you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the most important need that you have is the forgiveness that he can give, the promise of life eternal through him. And so we're reminded that Jesus later in this gospel asserts in John chapter 14 and verse 6, he says of himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. And he makes an exclusive claim, no one comes to the Father except through me. We're going to look today at two truths about the exclusive nature and work of Jesus. And then at the close today, hopefully we'll take a spiritual inventory. But today, first, I want you to note with me that Jesus possesses an authority that none other possesses. Jesus possesses an authority that none other possesses. You know, this uh, dialogue here with Nicodemus uh, is, is, is so true, and there's so much truth in it. And we talked last week how Nicodemus, while we don't know for sure, we do understand later in John's gospel that Nicodemus prepared Jesus' body for its burial, which leads us to believe that Nicodemus had a change of heart. And we say, well, how could Nicodemus have had this change of heart? Well, he heard the truth of God. 
You see, the, the book of Romans tells us that a person can't believe if he or she doesn't hear. And so it's so important that we as the church proclaim the truth of God in a world that's becoming ever more chaotic, in a world that's becoming more and more dark. We need the truth. We need the light of the word of God to be proclaimed. And Jesus says here in verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. Now, Jesus, this is a clear reference to himself because elsewhere he calls himself the son of man. We know that Jesus is fully God and fully man. One plus one equals one in this case. He was totally God and totally man. You say that can't be. How could he be fully God and fully man? Well, listen, the creator is not subject to the laws of creation. The, 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 we as created beings, we can't be two distinct beings in one, but God is creator can be whatever he determines. And so we must understand that Jesus here is affirming his humanity. You say, why is his humanity important to me? It's important to you and me because he had to become flesh that he might die to pay the price of our sin. He might die in the flesh that we might be saved. So Jesus here, what he's doing in verse 13, he's attesting to his authority. He is making it understood that among all human beings, his authority is unmatched. There's not a human being that can match the authority of God in the flesh. Now, we know that Elijah ascended to heaven. We know that Enoch lived and was not, and we assume that he too was taken up into heaven. Yet as we look at verse 13, Jesus is the only one who ascended into heaven who came down with a message. And, and last week we saw in the Sunday school message for those who were involved in Sunday school when Miriam and Aaron opposed Moses. And remember God's response to them. He said, when I speak to prophets, I may provide a vision, I may provide a dream, but when I speak to Moses, I I speak directly, but I appeal to you today, even better in Jesus, he came directly. God in the flesh, he, he's even greater. There's no intermediary needed. He himself is God. There was no need of transfer of authority or the communication of authority. His very word communicates authority. And the people in the Bible understood it. When Jesus was a child, you remember the account in Luke, his parents left him in, in Jerusalem and they wondered where he was. One parent thought uh, they had him and the other uh, thought they had him. And I can tell you this, it's always the dad's fault. All right. It's always the dad's fault. And I say that from personal experience. And I hear some amens probably quietly from people where maybe I left their child somewhere one time forgot. But they left Jesus, all right? And where did they find him? He was among the leaders in Jerusalem, older people, and he was amazing the people with his understanding. What, what about Nicodemus earlier in this chapter when he comes to Jesus? He saw something that was different, and he said, we know that you're a teacher from God. We understand the authority that you have is unmatched. Listen. Jesus is more than a prophet. Jesus is more than just a good person and a rabbi. Jesus is God. And with him, he possesses an unmatched authority uh, over men. In, in Acts chapter 14 in Lystra, Paul and Barnabas were doing some great works. And the people began to worship them. And they were upset. Paul and Barnabas, and they said, stop, we're men just as you are. In the last book of the Bible, in the very last chapter, John was preparing to pay homage, to bend the knee before an angel. And the angel said, don't do that. I'm a servant even as you are. But Jesus never refused worship. Mary Magdalene worshiped him. The disciples were saying it was wasteful. Jesus said, let her do it. And the point is this, Jesus is fully God. And as God, he stands alone as authority. No human, no prophet, no false God, no person possesses the authority that Jesus possesses. So we take his word as truth, and it is, and among them, 
we see what he says of himself. And that's leading to where we're going secondly today. What Jesus expresses of himself, and we see this, Jesus and Jesus alone is a person's way to right standing with God resulting in eternal life. Let me say it again, Jesus and Jesus alone is a person's way to right standing with God resulting in eternal life. You know, my favorite verse in all of the Bible is Galatians chapter 1 and verse 21. And it says this. And if you've been here for a number of years, you've heard it a number of times. Paul says, for I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, Christ died for nothing. You know what that says? Translated to us, if I could get to heaven by being good, why would God have sent Jesus to die? Think about that. Have you ever thought about that? If God is working on a system of good and bad, which by the way, if we had the videotape, we'd see we were worse than we were good. We tend to overestimate ourselves. But what Paul is saying is God were, if God worked on a system of weight and balances, then why would he have sent Jesus to die? That would have been foolish. But God isn't foolish. Why is that? Because the only way that a person will be made right with God is through what Jesus has done. That's why we must humble ourselves. We must say, God, Jesus did for me what I can't do. God, I have messed up my life. I have through my attitude, through my actions, through my words. I, there's an emptiness here. There's a void. I wake up every day yearning for something. And the reason, God, is that Jesus has done for me what I couldn't do. And I've been fighting this thing, Lord, too long. Paul refutes the thought that a person could be made right with God through his own effort. You see, there are really two main ways that someone thinks that he or she is going to be right with God. Some think, I'm going to try to be a good person. They try to be a good person. Uh, maybe they help people. Maybe, hey, they let that word slip, but, you know, really my heart is right, or, or maybe the gossip, but, you know, but I still do this, I do that, and we begin to play this game with God. God, I'm better than the person sitting across from me. I'm not as good as that person, but I know that person's right with you, so I must be okay. The problem is God doesn't compare us with each other. God compares us to himself. And he says in the scripture, be holy as I'm holy. And we're not holy and God is holy. But some people think that God works on this system of merit. But the problem is the right that I do here doesn't cover the wrong that I've done there. God doesn't work that way. That's not God's economy. But the other way and the right way is this, acceptance through faith in Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ paid the price for me, and I humbly believe in him. I turn from life the way I know it, and I trust in Jesus Christ. You see, at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, God made very clear the first way wouldn't work. When man was banished from the garden, you remember God sent the cherubim with the flaming sword to guard the tree of life as a picture of the fact that man could not reach up by his own and partake from the tree of life. That's saying that this idea that we can gain God's merit in favor by what we do, by trying to be good, we can't do it in our own strength. It is God reaching down to us, and that's what God did through Jesus Christ. Listen to what it says in John 3, 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, would not suffer spiritual death, but would have eternal life. So Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. He's the only one from heaven, and he's the only one who can save, period. Look at verse 14. Uh, he goes back, Jesus does, into the Old Testament in Numbers chapter 21, and, and, he, and, and shares briefly uh, a summary of that narrative in, found in Numbers 21. But he said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. 
You say, well, what was happening back when Moses lifted up the snake? Well, the people were embittered. They were complaining. They were moaning. They were sinful people, impatient, and God's patience with them wore thin. And so he sent among them poisonous snakes that bit the people. Some of the people died, but others lived. And they were coming to Moses saying, what must we do? God told Moses, uh, make an image of a snake, lift it up. And if they'll look to it, they'll live. And those who look to it, they did live. God prescribed for that temporal moment, a remedy to the people's sin. This Old Testament event is similar to what Jesus did in a far greater way. We see in both the serpent that was lifted up in Jesus that God provides what man needs. Man was in need back in Numbers 21. They had no answer. God provided the answer. In in the Old Testament, Numbers 21, Moses' object was lifted on a pole. We know that Jesus was lifted up on a cross. Uh, We know in Moses' day, looking at the object in faith gave healing. And the scripture tells us in John 3, 16, that if we would believe, if we would look to him, Jesus in faith, we would have salvation. And in each case, sin was atoned for. The sin of the people in Numbers 21 was covered by that look toward what was lifted up. And our sin is covered always through Jesus. But there are some distinct differences. Jesus' provision covers all sins of all time. Forever, always, the snake didn't. Jesus' provision gives spiritual healing. They received physical healing in Numbers 21. Hey, I don't know what your health situation is today, but I can tell you on the authority of God's word, even more than physical healing, you need spiritual healing. Because spiritual healing is the healing that gives what we see, the, the third difference. Jesus' provision is eternal. Eternal for all time. Before we close, I want to look at this greater deliverance, deliverance from the power of sin and death. But I want to look real quickly at two points. The universal invitation. The universal invitation. I love the... Um, words that are used here, the pronouns that are used. As we look in verse 15, so that everyone, verse 16, for God so loved the world, all of the people, all right? Verse 16 says that everyone, or your translation may say, whosoever believes. Verse 18 Anyone, anyone who believes. In Malachi, the word is told, God is no respecter of persons. That that means he doesn't play favorites. It goes to everyone. You know, these past few weeks, our, our mailbox has been flooded with extra mail. And it's been the postcards that we sent out for our uh, our uh, outdoor service back two or three weeks ago. We did mass mailings, and we found out there are a lot of people who don't live there or who moved, and they have returned to sender. We probably received 40 or 50 of those back. The Lord knows our hearts. We tried as hard as we could, but they weren't there. Do you realize that God's invitation goes to everyone? Everyone. He doesn't miss anyone. And it's saying, whoever. I don't care if you've served 20 years in a penitentiary. I don't care if you've taken someone's life. I don't care if you've done things that you're too ashamed to speak of. God's word says anyone, anyone, if you would believe, if you would believe, you would be saved. And think of it this way. The harder the person is, the farther they've walked from God, the more glory God gets when they're right with him. Jesus said, only the sick need a doctor. Only those that will say, hey, God, I need you, can receive it. The universal invitation. But then I want you to see the exclusive means. The exclusive means. It says everyone, but it's qualified. 
It's qualified in this. Verse 15, everyone who believes in him. Verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that everyone who believes in him. For God did not send the world, the, the son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved, what? Through him. Anyone who believes, verse 18, in him is not condemned. Listen, there's one way to right standing with God, and that's through Jesus Christ. I have a key ring. A lot of y'all are more important than I. You probably have more keys, but I have 11 keys on my key ring. There's only one that fits the door of the church, and it happens to always be about the ninth or tenth one I seem to try. It doesn't matter. I can come outside and... Um, probably going to get knocked over the head sometimes because sometimes about 11 30 or 12 I'll come over here and be sure everything's straight and Karen's already asleep by then I think somebody's going to come in here and knock me over the head and I don't know what take my money I guess but sometimes I come even in the daylight and I'll get that wrong key and it won't go in and I can try as hard as I want but it's not the right key there are people today, they're trying to get God's favor by being good. That's not the right key. There are people today that says, I'll follow this religion. That religion seems good. That person seemed to be a devout person. That's not the right key. The only key is Jesus Christ. As the church, may we never lose sight of the truth that there's only one way. All religions don't lead back to God. The scripture says there's a way that may seem right to a person, but its end is destruction. I wonder today, where do you stand? Where do you stand? Verse 18, anyone who believes in him is not condemned, doesn't stand guilty of judgment. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Where are you standing? What it's saying is, it's not that this happens after you die, that right now you're either in a position where you're not condemned or you are condemned. You're either in a position where you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ or you've not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The beautiful message of the gospel is if you're at a position where you've not believed, it can change. I, again, I believe Nicodemus is an example of that as we look at the narrative of his life. It seems that he believed in the same individual, Nicodemus. The same can happen in your life, in my life. The problem is a lot of us haven't applied that truth. We may know it up here, but we've never embraced it. We may have been confused in a day of pluralism and universalism to think it couldn't be true, but it is true. Jesus said it. And Jesus said it. And when we look at Jesus, he was the most selfless being to walk the face of the earth. He didn't walk in arrogance. He walked in service. Everything that he did, he was sinless. And he said that of himself. And he spoke the truth. We must believe it. I wonder today if you believed in him. I'm going to pray a prayer in just a moment. You don't have to pray this out loud, but as if you've never done it before in your life. Now, if you have done that, if you have prayed to accept the Lord Jesus and, and you know the Lord Jesus and you have followed him in baptism and, and you are not ashamed of him, you don't need to pray this prayer. But if you're at a time now where you're really not sure that you've ever believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can silently you to God, voice this prayer that I'm going to voice, and then we'll close in prayer. But let's pray. Lord, for those here today, they might pray, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Father, I've been trying to live this life in my own control, thinking that it's all going to work out at the end, thinking that I will be able to do something that will merit my right standing, <clears throat> In the end, but Lord, I realize today that I can't do what only Jesus could do for me. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe that he arose from the dead, and I believe that he is worthy of my devotion. So Lord, I turn from my self-centered life, and I trust Jesus Christ for my salvation. 
Father, forgive me of my sin and set me in right standing with you. Lord, I believe it in Jesus' name. And Father, as individuals may have prayed this prayer today for the first time, Lord, I pray for those who have already prayed this prayer, which may be many, that, Lord, you would continue to confirm in their heart the truth of the fact that it is Jesus and Jesus alone. No other work of man, no other religion, only Jesus who came and gave his life for our sin. And so, Lord, bless it. Bless the decisions that are made today. Continue, Lord, to speak truth through your word to us, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to give you an opportunity, if you've never made a decision for Christ publicly, to do that today. We're going to sing an appropriate hymn, Have Thine Own Way.